My name is Dede Utomo. I'm with the Yanisara Foundation in Surabaya, Indonesia. Uh, also with APROM Foundation, a regional organization where our office is based in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, I've been working on in this issue since uh, 1980, so about 38 years. And um, my interest is actually in the, the, the cultures of Southeast Asia and Asia in general, um, and also on sexuality studies. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights for us, uh, activists, especially and probably people in the community who care, uh, is a vision, is a dream. People like me, who's a bit older, we also grew up under dic dictatorships. And for us, it was like the light at the end of the tunnel. It also, it's also to give hope that it's possible. And especially uh, since uh, the last decade, it has turned out that at the international level, maybe not at the regional level yet, it has increasingly become a reality. We, we, we didn't think about that uh, in the 80s when we started. So it's kind of a framework for work that is in progress. Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines were for including sexual orientation, gender identity in the uh, ASEAN Declaration of Human Rights, but of course the other states uh, you know, didn't accept that, okay. The most beautiful thing is the UPRs, the Universal Periodic Reviews at the Human Rights Council, which, you know, happens every four years. And whether you're Iran or Indonesia or China, you cannot run away when, let's say, question, you know, hey, Iran, what are you doing to your <laughs> LGBTI populations? Like, uh, you know, you cannot say, I mean, you could always uh, go to the bathroom and pretend that that question wasn't there, but you have to answer it. So the, um, it's not perfect. Many people are cynical about the UN, but it's the only contract we have between our states and the international world. Our situation is work in progress. Uh, we didn't manage to get, you know, SOGI. Uh, sexual orientation, gender and expression into the ASEAN Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah, and then there's Pink Dot Singapore, there is the possibility of gender, legal gender recognition in Thailand, Vietnam has been, you know, uh, mulling over uh, family law, um, and the Philippines, there is actually a same-sex marriage bill uh, in the Philippine Congress. Um, so that's at the state level. At the activist level, of course, we use it. Sometimes we cannot use it at the national level, we use it at the local level. I've learned from this work that you have to treat society, states as non-monolithic. So UDHR is a very useful tool because it's the UN, it's translated into all the languages. And, and by the way, in Indonesia, and, uh, it's in the constitution, in the amendment. So. Well, the bottom line is uh, for the countries or states where religion is a factor, certainly Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, um, it's something that haunts the politicians. I think that's a fair assessment. Now, Singapore, of course, is an interesting case because you don't think, but, but the, Christ, the, the Christian conservatives could, I mean, they've actually stated it, they, will, they could bring down the government, and I think the Lee dynasty is a bit nervous about that. That's why, so it's, there is religion. And, and then the countries like Vietnam and maybe Thailand where religion is not that much of a specter, um, then it's culture. Uh, Although Vietnam, for example, has changed. Uh, homosexuality used to be called social ill. Now they said, well, maybe it's not social ill. So there, even their socialism has shifted a bit. Um, so it's a, I think it's a generational thing as well. I mean, I, I learned from an African activist that young people are colonized by older people like me, I guess. I mean, but I'm not so bad, I guess. <laughs> And um, they have to break free from the old generation. And they have their own values. If you talk to young people in Vietnam, even in Brunei, they know what they want. They want pleasure, they want uh, you know, love, um, and other things. Um, and it's the elder people who um, could not accept it. I remember Ban Ki-moon, the former Secretary General of the UN, once said, you know, I grew up not understanding sexual orientation and gender identity, but I quickly learned that culture and religion cannot be used to violate human rights. It was used to violate women's rights, 
We do not want that to repeat. And, and you know, there is another minority that is being persecuted. Well, you know, uh, I grew up under uh, the dictatorships when things were bleak. Uh, we could lose our lives, <laughs> could be tortured and all that. I lost a few students uh, in the 90s. Uh, we know that you have to be patient. Unfortunately, or I don't know, if, well, unfortunately, I mean, it'd be nice to have it a light or way, but we know, also know that it's not a pie in the sky. It will just fall into your lap. You got to fight for it. And so this is where I think I'd like to kind of report that we are gaining allies as we go along. And we get theologians who are siding with us, but also we get human rights lawyers who now understand, I think in the Asian context, that you cannot have partial human rights. Human rights are universal, they're total. Uh, you cannot just be selective. I think, I think that they still do um, because what I learned from my you know, uh, mentors in human rights studies and practice uh, is that human rights are universal. That's, there's the key word, universal. And so whoever tries to make it particular, you know, Islamic human rights, Malaysian human rights, he'll fail. Uh, because they're wrong, that's all.